So welcome back. Um, this is part three of my uh, series of recorded uh, lectures on the Digital Oil Field 2.0. And I'm uh, um, saying hello to my audience here in um, Pandit D. Dayal uh, Petroleum University in, in, in western part of India. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, uh, try to record these uh, lectures and uh, try to pass along some information to the SBE Student Society at the university. Uh, my name is Jim Crompton. I'm a professor of practice in the Petroleum Engineering Department at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, my earlier two um, uh, segments on the, the digital oil field had to do with kind of the expectations and the reality and the, and the you know, kind of the challenges that are, are, are really uh, going on because this, is, uh, this isn't easy to do. Digital transformation is always uh, difficult for an industry, even down to a company, down to an individual, with regard to all of the changes that you're trying to make. So I'm trying to, you know, kind of parse this, uh, all of this information into a series of four, you know, sort of recorded lectures. And I hope that you enjoy them. Um, I hope that you have an opportunity to, uh, you know, to listen to them and then, you know, answer questions, ask me questions through email or, or whatever kind of facility that we can. But you can see I've been practicing my social distancing and I'm in desperate need of a haircut. But anyway, we'll, we'll keep going on with, uh, with the first slide. I've, I've used this picture before. I, I copied it from uh, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Tony Edwards, who is one of the early kind of evangelists in the digital oil field uh, with his company BP. Now he he works for a cons consulting company, UK Norwegian company called Step Change Global. And they help companies to, to kind of build this uh, connectivity between the field and the office. Um, so you can see, you know, kind of the, the first part of this uh, uh, diagram. Uh, it was really the focus of Digital Oil Field 1.0. And it's probably going back nearly 20 years ago. Uh, when a lot of this effort was really trying to start. And in that, you know, we were recording lots more data. And I mentioned before about the increase in the digital intensity, you know, of everything from drilling, completions, production, uh, operations and maintenance. Um, you know, the subsurface was as always a part of this as well, but it probably had its, you know, really kick into increasing digital intensity, you know, well before, you know, the digital oil field 1.0 got started. But the main, you know, kind of thrust of what I want to talk about here is in, is the, some of the changes in digital oil field 2.0. And that I, I kind of talked about before the digital oil field is moving to the edge. Uh, we're not as concerned for bringing all of that data that we gather in the field back to the office because new technology uh, is allowing us to do an awful lot of valuable work at the edge, on the oil field, uh, on the drilling rig. And in that is kind of a, the, the new kind of part to this uh, diagram. And is a part where we can actually take artificial intelligence, machine learning, edge processing, you know, the cloud connectivity, and actually create an awful lot of value through the field automation systems and the smart equipment that are being deployed. So yes, we are better connected with, uh, you know, the, with the digital oil field 2.0. And we'll talk about some of those connectivity solutions uh, but now we're and we still have you know the remote decision support centers a second pair of eyes that are, are looking over you know our operations by experts in the office and we have that ability to connect in a much better way through our supply chains and and to build these digital twin models uh, largely based on uh, data driven uh, analytical techniques and and to, to try to you know provide more uh, insight and advice and better planning for the, the field operations. But once we have a pretty good idea of what, what that model is or what a way to uh, optimize a particular workflow, we can bring that model, uh, that, that analytics, and we can put it onto a chip on a piece of equipment in the field. And, and pretty soon now we have greater use of, of the information. We don't have to move it back and forth, but we are able to control all the smart equipment that we have. Well, this, this is a kind of a, a cartoon that, uh, you know, first put together, you know, probably more than 15 years ago. And it was really trying to talk about some of the basic components of this connectivity. 
uh, you know, we have field networks um, kind of start from there. And, you know, we're, we're kind of growing from uh, the traditional SCADA networks onshore or maybe a DCS uh, system on an offshore facility. But we're adding to that SCADA network. We're not just limited by, you know, what we could connect, uh, you know, through wires and, and programmable logic controllers and, uh, you know, SCADA computers and, and the like. Mobility, the, the, the concept of, uh, you know, wireless connectivity and bringing, you know, some of that data straight to, uh, uh, you know, ruggedized, uh, you know, tablets or smartphones or, or different things like that. So the connected worker has an access to all this information. So we are, we have greatly increased the field network, even in some places, you know, kind of connected it with fiber optics. So, uh, you know, the connectivity is, is greatly improved in that local field network. But, but now we have to have this uh, connectivity to the office. And that's kind of this challenge of the first mile network. And that's where we need to connect all of the data that's being, uh, or the relevant amount of data that's being connected into the field. You know, it, it can be stored through an historian. We have, you know, some uh, connectivity, often it's third party. Here we're going from a private network to back to a public network to allow us to connect to our home office, wherever that central site is. And, and with that, obviously we've got our res a remote decision support network kind of set up. And from there, it's easier you know, to get to the rest of the world. It's, it's easier to get to other, you know, uh, offices within our corporate environment, or it's easier to get, uh, you know, to uh, our supply chain or almost using the internet to connect to almost anywhere in the world where we may have an expert or a, or a resource that we want to bring into a, a particular kind of problem. But, you know, for the last 20 years, a lot of the problems have been that first mile, getting the data from the field to the office. And that's where, you know, often we face, uh, you know, communication uh, limits. Uh, we don't have robust public uh, telecommunications networks around this. So we, we've struggled a bit in, in making that connection. Well, some operators have kind of taken the challenge in their own hands. And particularly Statoil, or now Equinor, has done an awful lot to, um, you know, to kind of invest in and develop that high-speed connectivity between the fields on the Norwegian continental shelf and their major offices in Stavanger and Bergen and Trondheim. Uh, and uh, so they can bring together this digital oil field 1.0 goal of linking the field to the office, even taking remote control, uh, you know, from the office and, you know, not unmanning, but at least reducing the manning levels on the facilities offshore. And as I've kind of talked about, when they move further north into the Bering Sea, that's where they want to have operations essentially that don't need any human beings there on a regular basis at all. And, you know, some of that connectivity through an industry consortium is kind of even connected the Norwegian continental shelf with the UK uh, shelf. And all of a sudden Aberdeen and a lot of the fields on the UK side are connected as well. Well, these sort of connectivity um, solutions or, or kind of projects, if you will, have, have kind of cropped up in almost all of the large um, uh, oil producing basins in the world. And this is just one of the solutions in the US Gulf of Mexico, where uh, one operator, and this was BP, who had kind of large uh, um, in investments uh, offshore in the deep water. Um, and they wanted to figure out a way to connect those uh, platforms to their offices. And they, they did it with a fiber optic, uh, you know, kind of link. And of course, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a circular one. So they have redundancy. If something might happen and connect, and which would cut, uh, you know, the, the, the fiber optic connection to Houston area, well, they can still bring the data through the, the other uh, you know, direction and move it through the Mississippi and then onto landlines to connect. So, you know, even uh, counting for problems, be they storm related or maybe it's just some, you know, construction uh, interference with, with their uh, telecommunications, they can now, you know, with fiber optics, really get beyond that, uh, um, you know, kind of um, latency sort of problem that uh, microwave sort of connectivity would have. So, you know, all of a sudden there's greater breakthroughs and this thing is happening in, in Australia in Thailand and, and many, many other places. Well, one of the things that we have as well as that improvement in connectivity 
And, you know, there are companies that now that have just, you know, started up to provide greater connectivity, uh, you know, to the oil field. The, um, the ability of kind of new, of new sensing technologies and that, you know, kind of putting on smart devices, this Internet of Things technology with the advance in its sensing, you know, we could do a lot more than just have pressure and temperature and maybe vibration sensors on our equipment. You know, the, with, with all of this new technology, we can uh, have GPS uh, that tells us where we are. Uh, we can have motion velocity displacement sensors, temperature sensors, humidity and moisture sensors, acoustic, which kind of gets into our vibration oriented sensors. But now we have chemical noses and that essentially can, uh, uh, can measure the amount of, uh, uh, you know, chemicals, you know, that might be in the air. And that's very, very important for methane and, and other, uh, you know, pollutant emission sort of uh, sensors. Uh, flow rates, um, you know, essentially uh, in the drilling area, force, load, torque, strain, all of these sort of things become very, very important parameters that we're trying to do. And we can make, uh, kind of have uh, sensors on, you know, to predict leaks and, and help us to be able to do something about that. And, you know, accelerometers, even now machine vision and optical. Uh, uh, sort of sensors as we go through that. So, you know, the, the whole world of sensors, which mostly just was, you know, how, where can I put a pressure sensor, which is a, a traditional, uh, you know, piece of equipment in the field, we now can open up to all these different ways of looking at things. When we have all of this data, you know, and we have this connectivity, and particularly in the area of cloud uh, connectivity in the area of mobile communications, all of a sudden that worker out in the field can take all of this data with him. And he's not just a, uh, a, a person who, who collects data for some office use. You know, a lot of that data can, and it can be put back to, to him or her, you know, as they're in the field. And so they've got a lot more information about what they're trying to do. And that might be, you know, equipment or information on the equipment, information on best practices and maintenance and operations. And so they become a much more, um, you know, transparent can, uh, partner in all of this digital world that's going on. And, you know, we have to keep them safe. So we've got a bunch of different sort of solutions that allows this to, you know, to take this, you know, uh, personal uh, sort of solutions out in the field with him. Well, this Internet of Things edge devices, I want to just talk about that just for a minute. And essentially what we are doing, and, and we're using certainly the cloud to be able to connect us from, to, uh, from field to office, and, but almost from the field to anywhere uh, that we want to try to go. And a lot of this information is now not going through a private channel to a company's data center and their kind of proprietary ways of solving this. Through a cloud, you know, sort of vendor, you know, this data can be shared, you know, much more widely. But all of these different sensors I was just talking about, all of these things can be connected by these edge computing devices and through industrial PCs, gateways, um, you know, micro data centers, sort of things that we can put as an intermediate between field and, and office. But a lot of these things are not just ways of transmitting more data. They're also ways that we can do an awful lot of the processing there in the field, where, you know, we might have only moved 5% of the data from the field to the office in digital oil field 1.0. Now we probably aren't moving much more data than that. But we're using a lot more of the data in processing within the field on edge devices. Well, translate that to an oil field sort of picture. And IoT in the oil field, you are talking about sensors on artificial lift units trying to improve pump performance. We have sensors on tank levels so that we know, you know, when to, to we have to, you know, have come in and, and remove wastewater for for that or crude if indeed our um, way of transporting that is maybe by truck. Uh, but we're measuring injection pressures. Uh, so it isn't just on producers. Matter of fact, a lot of the most instrumented wells in an oil field will be in a secondary recovery thing on the injector uh, in wells, chemical usage as well. And all of us, you know, through uh, edge computings, the new sensors, uh, you know, the cloud storage and computing telecommunication, we can put it into actionable information. Well, this edge computing architecture uh, is now becoming very important. And all of a sudden, this is where we are looking at taking 
all of the smart devices and all of the information that we could collect in the field in that sort of field connectivity uh, sort of solution through the edge, real-time data processing and local processing, et cetera, essentially we can move it to the cloud. You know, this, you know, may have been, um, you know, important for, you know, personal uh, social media, other sort of connectivity we use with our smartphones in our daily lives, but taking this to the industry, to a, to a refinery, to an oil field, and essentially the same architecture allows us to take the digital oil field and move all, a lot of, awful lot of the work to the edge. Well, if we look at these, these technologies, we know we've talked a lot about the cloud already, but we're, we're, we're going from this infrastructure that we are creating to more and more integration in terms of, you know, kind of integrating this all into a digital platform. And then from there, we can build all of these different applications onto it, which can aid in collaboration, in surveillance and monitoring, in our connectivity, we can bring, you know, kind of our, our financial, you know, kind of uh, calculations into the field. And all of a sudden we're, we're looking at, you know, not profitability on a yearly basis, but on a monthly or daily, you know, or even daily sort of basis of, you know, how much, uh, not how much oil we are producing, we can do that, but how much profit are we producing by doing this? Well, in one of the ways that we are making this connection, I showed you the kind of more of a general IT sort of view of edge computing. But it, for the oil field, that involves us connecting our SCADA systems, our field instrument and, automa and automation control systems with our corporate IT systems. And this convergence of OT and the, uh, the, the ICS, uh, the in con control and, and computing systems, and the SCADA and the IT is really bringing about a revolution in these sort of field to corporate office sort of networks. And while the complexity is very uh, critical in getting this all right, because we have to have these networks secure, we have to have them performant, we have to be able to, to uh, deal with the velocity of information that's being generated out in the field and then moving it wherever it needs to do, wherever that decision maker happened to be, whether they might be in a remote uh, decision support center in the office, or as a you know a connected maintenance uh, a person that's working in the field. Well, these control systems and connectivity are becoming really important as we converge, you know, these sort of environments. We used to not include these control systems within our overall corporate IT networks, but now that that's a, a requirement, and you know the the integration of all of this technology you know, to, that we can really take the control systems that are on the, the producing platforms or on the drilling rigs, and we can integrate them all into a much, you know, more integrated and holistic view of what's going on in the field. There are places where we can use fiber. There's places where we can't. Uh, we, we operate in, in much more remote locations than a lot of the public networks, you know, kind of can, can reach out to. So there are times when we have to use not only the wireless, we have to go all the way to satellite. And in some of our more remote locations, there may be an exploratory drilling rig where you're really not going to make the huge investment in all of the infrastructure that may come later when you have a producing field, but we can still connect that remote location into the rest of our global network. And we do that through the satellites. Clearly, we have problems with latency, we can't move as much data and deal with the velocity issues that we have with, uh, uh, you know, the satellite sort of connectivity. But through other computing technologies, we can compute and just store and, and forward just the critical pieces of information. So we may not have second by second information, but we can have information that may just be five or 10 minutes, you know, later than what's happening in the field, but we can have it anywhere in the world. So this, you know, kind of connectivity can go from all the way from satellite to local area networks, wireless, all of these sort of connectivities are bringing us together and integrating all these things, whether it be from, from fiber or to satellite. Well, and we, we go through this and you know, what is the, uh, the, the end result? The end result is really there's a, with a, lot of, a lot of data to be visualized. And through you know, these, these control rooms that have just you know, a whole walls that are full of these, uh, uh, you know, screens, uh, computer screens, 
that are displaying all this data in near real time. And it allows, you know, kind of people in the field to, to be connected with the experts in the office. And, and all of a sudden the information coming back and forth really leads to a collaboration that never was possible before. Well, I showed a little bit about that platform or that integration that we need to. And I've kind of mentioned this before, so I won't uh, dwell on it. But essentially, we need the co uh, connectivity and the collaboration of a lot of different sorts of technology input. We need the, the financial data, the information technology infrastructure, the engineering technology solutions, the operations that I talked about before, and the oil field service companies that have frequently given us the solutions that we have for subsurface information. Bringing this all together, which is a task, and many companies are working in this direction that probably don't have all of this put together yet, but it is a direction for this search for the digital core, the digital platform, and some people are calling this the digital twin. You have some organizations, and this one from Saudi Aramco, in a, in a control room in, uh, in Dahran, and essentially, they have connected the kingdom. They have connected all of the uh, oil fields, the processing uh, units, the export terminals, and they can bring all of that data from the entire uh, kingdom of Saudi Arabia into this one uh, operation center. And obviously, this is the Cadillac of, of all of these remote decision support centers, but it shows what is possible when you know the investment in all of this infrastructure you know really leads to creating greater value well where is the future it's kind of interesting to, to kind of dream about it a little bit you know this is the norwegian's dream as i talked about as they move uh you know into oil fields in the barren sea within the arctic you know they really don't want to have a platform any humans anywhere near it so we, they've taken the platform and they move it to the seabed and they still have this concept of the manufacturing or operations factory. This now it's on the sea floor. And here, you, who is your maintenance crew? Well, it's a robot. Uh, and, it, and there's you know ways of storing chemicals and equipment that might be needed that the robots can go pick up and then work on the wellhead. And, and a lot of this information may be connected through, you know, say the fiber optics in an in a export pipeline from the field and the nearest human being may be a couple hundred kilometers away. And again, in one of those remote decision support centers, this time with a lot of control. Well, some of this is in the future, but some of this we've already done. And here, you know, as a platform in Northwest uh, Shelf of Australia, where the, the Australian operator Woodside on their Angel gas production platform has essentially developed a normally unmanned platform. And when everything are going well, you won't see a human being on this platform at all. It is just highly automated and it is, you know, transmitting all of that information to a control room on shore. And this, this first, uh, you know, sort of platform started in 2008. So we've got more than a decade's worth of experience on how to do this, when it is, you know, an economic value to do that. And I, I kind of mentioned this field before in a previous lecture. But we can take this, you know, further on. And here we have the, the Norwegian uh, uh, continental shelf Valamon field, which is the first platform in, in Equinor's portfolio to be remotely controlled from land. And here we, we've got a few years experience of this. There are other Norwegian operators doing similar things and experiments pretty much around the world in, in this sort of a concept of remote control, not just remote surveillance, not just remote decision support, but remote control in what we're trying to do. So this is going to be the end of part three. But I want you to try to kind of think about all of these, how these technologies are really enabling a very different way of operating. So, you know, it's, it isn't just about the technologies, although they are critical. It's about the integration. It's about the data. It's about the convergence of some of this technology into a way of changing the way we operate in a dramatically different fashion. And that's really what digital transformation should be all about. Thank you, and we'll see you again in part four.